Welcome back, everybody. Hope you're having a good start to your week. This is Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. I'm your host, Scott Cobrantz, along with my co-host, my partner here always, that is Mr. Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report covering the league and also the Raiders columnist up on sportsnot.com. You can follow him on x.com at Mo Moten. M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully. You can also catch my work up on Sports Knot. And uh, we're ready and geared up for another week. We're going to do, again, for the next few weeks, we're doing just one show per week. Obviously, news. We don't. We got some stuff that we're going to do today, which is different. But we are taking the time. And once camp rolls back around, we will be back with you full time as we usually are. So, Mo, we're going to do something fun today. By, by the way, though, listen, for those of you out west, Raider Nation's everywhere. We hear from callers all over the country, as you'll see today again. We'll have our Raider Nation mailbag in segment two. But in segment one, we're going to do something fun. Mo and I are going to go through our top five quarterbacks in Raiders franchise history. Do you think you know who they are? Do you have yours? Leave it in the comments there. Also, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Just look for Silver and Black today. Please subscribe rate and review we would appreciate that very much if you're watching us on youtube thanks again for watching hit the subscription and the notifications bell and a thumbs up is always nice too we appreciate that too okay mo so we're we're talking about quarterback stuff uh and it's funny we have some calls later on the show because listen the quarterbacks are always important now more than ever some people continue to disagree with us on our assessment so far again we can always be wrong uh, on Aiden O'Connell and his role and how could he be a franchise quarterback? Can, is he not a franchise quarterback? I have people on X.com telling me that I'm crazy. Look at Joe Montana. Look at uh, uh, Brady. Look at all these guys that went past the first round. But in reality, even if 40% of the first round draft picks that are quarterbacks are successful, when you get to round two, three, and four, it goes down even more. So we're going to talk about those top five quarterbacks, but Mo is I, I'm, I'm trying to understand because Raider Nation's really smart. They know their football, um, but I see a lot of folks trying to s- kind of put down the fact that quarterbacks are so important when we see it every day in every way in the NFL. Scott, I'll be honest with you. It's uh, look if the Raiders had a potential franchise quarterback fans would be saying how important the quarterback position is but because the Raiders <laughs> are not in a position to tout a potential franchise quarterback right now. You have to play up. Well, what else can the Raiders do to win football games? Defense run the ball. They have all these offensive playmakers, but if we're being honest, the Raiders right now, their quarterback situation is very questionable. Uh, we already know that Garner Minshew is a spot starter back of quarterback. He's, he's been that for three teams already in his career, Jacksonville, Philadelphia, and Indianapolis. And Aiden O'Connell is a question mark. So we don't know yet. Now, while we think Aiden O'Connell is a low-end starter backup, he may surprise us and he may turn into a starting caliber quarterback. Who knows? Never but know. as as for right now, and I said this on I said this last week, it's too early to panic about what you're hearing, uh, what you heard out of OTAs and mandatory minicamp. But thus far, the quarterback competition has been lackluster. Uh, multiple beat reporters have said inaccurate passes, uh, just – no one has taken a clear edge yet. Again, we still have the whole summer for someone to stand out, and it's too early to hit the panic button right now. Yeah. But this is about what we expected at this point. Defense to dominate with the continuity, the offense to to have its rough points with the new offensive coordinator, and two guys battling who have not been long-term stars in their careers. Right, and I don't mind the optimism. If somebody says, hey, I, I, I believe we don't know – what Aiden O'Connell can do. So you saying he's not a a franchise quarterback. I disagree because we don't know yet. I can, I can, I can live with that. I I think that that there's, there's truth to that. Uh, I just giving my opinion though. My opinion is that I don't think he will be, but be, as I've said, Mo to you and to everybody in the audience, I'd love to be wrong about that. He's a good dude and all that stuff that we always talk about, but the, the quarterback position continues to be an issue for the Raiders. And I can just tell you this, the Raiders could have a top five defense. And if their quarterback play is subpar, they're going to struggle. It just is. Even with a great defense, you you have to have somebody who can at least move the ball down the field. I'm not saying these guys can't do it. I'm just saying you find yourself in a precarious position 
if you don't have at least adequate, and I say adequate, just adequate quarterback play. So we'll see how it goes. But today, Mo, we're going to talk about some of the greatest guys to ever play the position for the Raiders. And, uh, you know, I did quite a while ago a top 10 list of these guys, and and it surprised me when I did this list. And we're going to get it. We're going to do the top five here, and, and Mo and I will give you our rankings. We'll see if they match because we have not shared uh, who they are on our list. So we'll, we'll see who that is. But I was surprised because the success, if you look at the success of the Raiders in the past, Mr. Moten, um, the Raiders quarterback position, I mean, there's these five names we're going to talk about pretty remarkable overall. But um, when you look at the history of the Raiders, I was just surprised at how many of the top 10 quarterbacks were guys who came late in their career or or were had very quick careers, meaning they had some good years with the Raiders. And that was kind of it. There, there was not a lot of Hall of Fame quarterbacks down in that five to ten uh, uh, time range, or I should say, ranking range, uh, that you would look at and say, "Wow, they were a great NFL quarterback." That's been the Raiders' history. I think it's been talked about. The Raiders, you know, haven't drafted well the quarterback position in the very rare times they do draft the quarterback position early. And a lot of the court, not a lot, but a number of the quarterbacks that were successful with the Raiders came from other teams, as we'll talk about today. The Raiders were their second, third, maybe fourth team in their careers, and they kind of had a career resurgence uh, in Los Angeles or Oakland. And this is why I think a lot of fans, the older fans, are very high on Gardner Minshew because they'll say, well, certain quarterbacks in, in the Raiders' past have had mediocre past, and they come to the Raiders, and all of a sudden they, they spout into Pro Bowl, All-Pro players, and – Lead us to Super Bowl. So why not Garner Minshew for the people who are out there who are rooting for Garner Minshew to win the job? They say, why not Garner Minshew? We heard the same discussion about Jimmy Garoppolo last year, too. So yeah, it, they understand the Raider history and they know where their quarterback is coming from. And it's not mostly it hasn't been from their own draft classes. Right. And we'll get into this because on my list, there's a guy that was picked in the 12th round. Yes. Back when they had 12 <laughs> rounds. So yes. for those of you who are Aiden O'Connell no, fans is. now. It was a long time ago, so things have changed quite a bit since that point. But we're going to talk through that. Uh, Mo, I'm going to let you start with you. We're going to count down from five. Uh, and so give me, a, for and a, for everybody listening too, when we look at the quarterbacks of Raiders history, who makes your top five? Who's that number five QB? So I'm going to touch the silver and black third rail with my number five pick. And I'm going to say Derek Carr. And I get it. A lot of the older fans are going to say, no way, Derek Carr doesn't belong on his list. He has a losing record as a starter, doesn't have any playoff wins, only two playoff appearances. I get all of that stuff. But when you open the Raiders' record books and you look at the passing numbers, Derek Carr is all over it. Now, I get it. The quarterbacks of the past only played 14 games. Derek Carr had 16 games, uh, 17 games before he left it, before he wound up going to New Orleans. But the value I get, I get it. He's, he was the Raiders starter for nine years, so of course he's going to have a lot of the volume records. But I think something has, should be said about having the longevity. Um, the mm -hmm. fact that he was able to start for the Raiders for nine years says something about his play and that he's not bottom of the barrel. I, I get a lot of fans are still upset of the way things ended, and I get that. But you, if you open again, if you open the Raiders record books, I know he's been there for nine years, so the longevity is on his side. But if you open Raider, if you look at you know game winning, uh, game winning drives, fourth quarter comebacks, he's a four time Pro Bowler with the Raiders. All those accolades actually mean something. So, yes, I understand nine years going to have those value records, but also four time Pro Bowler gave the Raiders some uh, a couple of good years, falling apart in twenty twenty one, make the playoffs. A lot of that was was Derek Carr pulling that team together. Remember that, and especially in two thousand sixteen. I get I get it. Those are few and far between. But still, I, I say Derek Carr with his longevity and the numbers that he put up, number five on my list. Right. And I agree with you. He's number five on my list, too, because I, I know longevity is not about winning because you will get to the top, top of this list in, in my top three, top two as well. And there's guys, not necessarily longevity guys, but they were guys that had impact. So I think when you're looking at a list like this, that's what I weighed into selecting them, Mo, was the idea and why I have Derek Carr at number five is because, you know, when you spent nine years somewhere, Clearly, now, again, you and I have been critical of, of what he could do, where he was in the NFL as far as being kind of a middle road quarterback, a top top 15-ish quarterback to 10 some years and even higher in a couple. 
so so to me that's what it was but he brought stability to that position if you remember be, prior to to Derek Carr with the exception of the Rich Gannon era for those few years uh, it was a mess at quarterback for the Raiders it was just constant evolve uh, revolving door and so uh, that's why he made my list too and yes he compiled a lot of numbers but that's not why I picked him I picked him primarily because of the combination of the longevity and the numbers that he put up, uh, especially early on in his career, had some some really good stuff going on there. So uh, I know that'll be polarizing for for some people, but I, I don't understand. I don't know who could be above him at number five. I just I could not find anybody who I could, uh, with all uh, thinking logically, put above Derek Carr at number five. Some people would say Schroeder or or Hostetler. Now Hostetler was Hostetler? the guy I've. I had said was a guy I started watching when I first became a Raider fan in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. So I, I identify, I get the Hostetler talk, but we, again, Derek Carr, four Pro Bowl seasons. I, you have to weigh the accolades into that. So yeah. I, with yeah. that, I'll say, I'll say Derek Carr over Hostetler or, or Jay Schroeder. And drafted by the Raiders, which I think is, is important too. Important. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, at number four, uh, let's get to number four. Uh, when you look at the best Raiders quarterbacks of all time, by the way, leave comments, tell us what you think, who would you have selected in these positions? If you think we're wrong, who would, who would you put there? Uh, Mo, I'll, I'll go now. Uh, I have, I have number four and I think some people might rank him higher, <laughs> but at number four, I have Jim Plunkett. I have Jim Plunkett, who of course, two Super Bowls with the Raiders came to the Raiders after really not doing anything with the Patriots. He was considered a bust. Then he goes to San Francisco. Then he goes to Oakland and he wins two Super Bowls with Tom Flores. Uh, and he was the Super Bowl uh, 15 MVP and um, has not made the pro or excuse me, the pro hall football hall of fame yet, but he's at number four. And this one is a combination of, to me, not only what he did on the field and, and the winning of two trophies, but also his leadership ability and that relationship that he had with Tom Flores. They were just always in sync, not always on the same page, but when they disagreed, they found a way to put it together and just go out and win ball games. I, I'm one of those people who had Jim Pluckett a, a little higher. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my number four, and it's Rich Gannon. Rich okay. Gannon is the first quarterback I watched while I understood football. So I started watching the Raiders – when Jeff Hostetler was the quarterback, but I was young. I was like eight years old. So I, I'm not fully understanding what's going on. I just know that I like the team that I'm watching. When Rich Gannon was the starting quarterback for the Raiders, I fully understood what was going on. Of course, we had the tuck pool and all of that, but <laughs> the Raiders were a perennial playoff contender with Rich Gannon. He had stops in Minnesota, Washington, and Kansas City, of course, before he came, came on to the Raiders and eventually became an MVP, an yeah. MVP player. So not only were the Raiders – perennial playoff contenders with him went to a Super Bowl and lost, of course. Yeah. But he was a league MVP. So with that said, he's clearly to me, he's clearly over Derek Carr with that league MVP award and getting the race to Super Bowl, having those playoff wins. Well, this this takes care of two birds with one stone because I had I had Gannon at three. So we just had them flip flopped, right? And and the reasons you mentioned for Gannon are the same for me. I know he did not win the Super Bowl. That's not a, I mean, nothing against Jim Plunkett, who won two and was a Super Bowl MVP. Amazing feat. Um, should he be in the Hall of Fame? I think he should. When you look at some of the guys that are in the Hall of Fame who've done less, including, I mean, including Joe Namath, by the way. Um, but Gannon came in in that early 2000s, like you said, a resurgence there after being a journeyman so he was the he was the typical and just storybook uh, Al Davis recovery project and what he was able to do and i mean again mvp of the entire league to me underscores why he was so great and again i know he wasn't there that, that long but the impact he had and he was able to do during that time frame was amazing and uh, led him i think to to end his career on a on a very high positive note so, so you have um, you have uh, him at four. You have Plunkett at three. Yes. Why, why Plunkett? And did you rate Plunkett I, ahead of Gannon? I, and it goes back to the Raider message: just win, baby. Right. <laughs> so that's and that's what the Raiders did with Plunkett. Yeah. So he, he two Super Bowls and a, don't forget a Super Bowl MVP. He yes. was comeback player of the year in 1980 and won Super Bowl MVP that year. So that was his that was his electric year. Right. 
Mm-hmm. And again, I understand his numbers don't stack up with some of the all the Hall of Famers, 18, 80 touchdown passes, 81 interceptions, but this is a different time period. But again, I can't ignore two Super Bowls, a Super Bowl MVP, comeback player of the year. So there's the, for me, the winning aspect is why he trumps Rich Cannon. Rich Cannon got to Super Bowl loss. Jim Pluckett gets there and wins the MVP of the game. So he wasn't just carried to that to that first uh, to that first Super Bowl that the Raiders played in with him. He yeah. was the most valuable player, and he was pretty good in that playoff stretch. If you look back at his numbers in that playoff stretch in the, oh, yeah. in the 1980 campaign, so he was. I don't want to say he was the sole reason the Raiders won that Super Bowl, but one of the main factors. So with that, if he had not won the Super Bowl MVP and maybe had one Super Bowl. Then I probably would have rated Rich Gannon higher than him, but with those two Super Bowls and that MVP comeback player of the year award, uh, Jim Plunkett number three for me. Yeah, and he had a, a you know good good postseason numbers. Jim Plunkett too, eleven touchdowns as well, eighty one rating, and uh, almost twenty three hundred passing yards in 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 playoffs. So so I get that. And and look, I could have flip flopped him either way. It's 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 tough yeah. when you're trying to 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 narrow down to that. And me, I went with a little bit of a recency bias there. Um, but I do think that, uh, that is fair. And you have, um, you have, uh, Plunkett, you have Plunkett third, you have Gannon fourth. I have the flip of that. Now, when we get to the top two, I gotta tell you, man, the top two for me was difficult. Um, I know it's easy for some people, but when you look at the numbers and the impact, boy, it's close. And we'll get into that too. Mo, who was your number two? So I have Darla Monica, the Mad Bomber, number two. Mm-hmm. And I and I have him at a sl- close number two simple because and we'll get to my num- we all know who number one. If you're a Raider fan, you know who my number <laughs> one is at this point. But LaMonica, also an AFL legend. So back yeah. this was back when the AFC was the AFL, basically. So the AFL was a separate league, then they would play the NFL champion in, in the Super Bowl, so to speak, right? So LaMonica gets to uh, a Super Bowl, the Raiders lose. But if you look at his accolades, five Pro Bowls, two all pro seasons. And a lot of his passing records didn't fall until Derek Carr broke them. And it took yes. Derek Carr nine years as a star to break those records. I remember back when LaMonica played, it was, what, 14 games. Yeah. So he had fewer games, different time. But he also the Matt Bomber, if you look at his numbers, he was before his time. Like He had two <laughs> seasons where he threw for 30-plus touchdowns. There's one season where he threw for 34 touchdowns, and that's still a season record for the Raiders. 34 touchdown passes in a season. Derek Carr hasn't even touched that record. So imagine he was, and he was doing this in the late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. So imagine what he would do in today's league with the way the rules are set up. LaMonica may throw for 40. He may be the Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> of today's era. If he was, if he was playing today, if you look at his numbers, it, it would surprise you because a lot of the quarterbacks back in the day, single digit touchdown passes, double digit interceptions. Oh yeah. Low completion. A lot of running the ball. LaMonica to me before his time, big numbers, has the accolade, just doesn't have the Super Bowl title. Yeah, and I think eras is important with this one. I was I was tough. I was I was about Lamonic Stabler and those two guys coming in uh, are I think because of when you look at the numbers. In fact, if you look at the numbers. You know uh, the games. To your point about the number of games in a season when you had Ken Stabler. And uh, he was 96 and 49 and one overall. You look at LaMonica as a, as a quarterback uh, because, again, because of the difference in the number of games. And I'm freezing up here. Sorry, guys, if you're watching us on YouTube. Weird, weird internet day. It just happens. He was 66 and 16 with six ties. Remember, the overtime rules, all that stuff changed. He also played less games. The other thing here, too, is you look at Stabler, and I have exactly the same ranking you have. So I have Daryl LaMonica, number two. Um, he almost passed for 20,000 yards, Stabler for 27,000, 164 touchdowns uh, as well. So so you look at these guys, very similar numbers, especially if you took LaMonica and put him more in the I think people forget about LaMonica and those numbers because most, I mean, the older Raider fans that, that watch us, the guys that have been fans since the 60s, for those of you who are out there, because I know you you write into me all the time, they understand it because they saw him play, not only in college, but in the pros. He was drafted by the Bills, didn't work out there, goes to the Raiders, and just lights it up. That mad bomber title was right. And even then, you know, yes, Al Davis, known for the vertical pass, but it was developing at that point. So if he would have played a few years later, 
five years later, believe me, Daryl LaMonica would be a guy no one would be able to forget, but but I definitely have him at number two as well, Mo. Uh, and I was I was happy that I got to speak to him and he was on the show uh, just a couple of years before he passed. So it's good stuff. We'll have to replay that for folks. But um, so yeah, Daryl LaMonica, we both have him at number two. And at number one, you have Jamarcus Russell. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 that was a dirty trick. I apologize. Uh, of course, that is Snake, Ken Stabler at number one. Mo, you know, you look at Stabler's numbers, undeniable. You look at the fact that uh, that he helped the Raiders win their first Super Bowl, Super Bowl, the leadership, the mystique, everything about him screams R Oakland Raider. And uh, of course, now they're Las Vegas Raiders, but everything about him screams Raider, the way he played, his toughness, his personality on and off the field. It's hard to deny in my book that he is the greatest quarterback in Raiders history. As you said, delivered the Raiders their first Super Bowl, uh, two seasons leading the league in passing touchdowns. So even though he had a portion of his career where it was a 14 game season and a portion where it went to 16. Mm -hmm. So he has he has the volume, he has the average numbers, he has the Super Bowl title, <laughs> so he he checks all the boxes for me winning, and that was and that to sum it up for my list, the reason why I have it ranked the way it is, Stabler, LaMonica, Plunkett, Gannon, Carr is the, the way I factored things is winning and accolades meant mm -hmm. the most to me. So winning football games not only just the regular season but in the postseason, uh, Pro Bowl years, All Pro years, League MVP. Uh, most of the most uh, comeback player of the year as plunk it was in 1980 and then the numbers because as as we've talked about it's hard to compare numbers between eras because you had an era where there was only a 14 game season the game was played very differently than it is today but the reason i i almost put lamonica one is because his game transcends that he could have been effective in today's yeah. league and he was effective back then with his numbers so I was close to putting LaMonica first, but Stabler being the guy, in my opinion, delivering the Raiders again, their first Super Bowl, and his numbers combined, winning, winning, winning matters most. Yes, it does. And Stabler's at the top of that list. Yeah, I I, I I completely agree. And for all the same reasons you said with LaMonica, amazing. Like I said, if he would have played five years later, who knows? But he also set the table for that Raiders franchise, I think, to take that next step in the 70s, uh, which, which obviously – went to uh, Ken Stabler and what he was able to do with that team and what Al Davis saw because he had a quarterback like Daryl LaMonica that gave him the vision to go towards what you saw with the Raiders and Fred Bolitnikoff and those guys uh, with Ken Stabler in 1977 and win that first Super Bowl. So great stuff. And, you know, we just wanted to run through that. It's, it's a slow time of the year, but it's debatable. Like some people will yeah. debate us on this. Some people will disagree. Yeah. And that's so, awesome. That's why we do these lists. Not because right. we are the definitive list makers, because we're not. I think number five will draw the most, <laughs> most disdain, but uh, we're interested. So let us know in the chat. Let us know in the comments what you think of this. Or you can reach out on x.com and hit SNB today, which is the handle for us on x.com or, or let Mo know at M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully. Tell us what you think and leave it in the comments wherever you're watching us on Facebook, Rumble, YouTube, X, wherever it is. Uh, we'd love to hear it though and see who else maybe you think edged into the top five. Uh, Scott, I'm just going to make a prediction here. I think a lot of the older fans are going to say, Mo, you wet behind the ears, young buck who, who's, who's still spinning up on his bib. You put Derek Carr on the list. How dare you? Like, oh, I I, I, there's a lot of disdain for Derek Carr, and I get that. And a lot of people, again, will put even Schroeder or Hostetler on that list. But but numbers aside, so let, let's forget the numbers because, again, there for nine years, even though I will say, as I said, you and I both agree, longevity does mean something. It does. Four Pro Bowl seasons, though. That's yeah. all I'm going to say. And, 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 that trumps Pasteller and what Schroeder did in their short time. And Derek Carr being there, I, I think, means something. But I think where we will get agreement is Stabler and LaMonica at the top of the list. I, I think some some fans will have LaMonica one simply because, as you said, he kind of set the table for the franchise. I think if, if LaMonica wins a Super Bowl, just oh. one Super Bowl, he probably votes number one because of the numbers he put up uh, during his time. No doubt about it. Exciting play. And – Hopefully, we'll be on the uh, another era of, of a long-term winning quarterback with the Raiders here, whether it's Aiden O'Connell 
Uh, I don't think it's Gardner Min Mar Minshew for sure because he is what he is, and it, he's a good player, and I'm glad he's a Raider. But, uh, you know, I, fans are looking for that next great quarterback to come in and win for the Raiders, so we'll see how it does. So I hope you enjoy the list. We'll do some more lists as we go through running backs, I think we're thinking of, um, and we'll get to defensive back. back, you know, whatever we want to do. There's a lot of – there's linebacker. We could do a lot of stuff. So we'll do that as we roll through June into July until we get to camp. Uh, so we'll have some fun with that. All right, we're going to take our break. When we come back, we'll finish the show out with the Raider Nation mailbag with some calls today, and uh, we'll see what kind of discussions you bring up. Could it be around a quarterback? Oh, I don't know, probably. We'll talk about that when we return. You're with Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black today. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. It is the home stretch here, the final segment of this Tuesday edition of Silver and Black Today. Reminder, we'll be once a week for the next few weeks. And then once we get to camp, Mo and I will be back to our normal schedule as we ramp up towards the 2024 season here on Silver and Black Today. Mo, it's only like two months and some days away. It just, you know, you get to that, the, the season is so long. Um, not for fans, but for us, we're working through it. We go to those late nights, all that stuff during the season. And then we get through the Super Bowl and the draft, free agency, and then you get this break and it goes so fast. With the snap of your fingers right after the 4th of July Independence Day, after those fireworks go off, you blink and oh, before you know it, training camp starts. The Baltimore Ravens start their training camp July 13th. So Jeez. you'll get a taste early, you know mid-july and then before you know it the rookies will be reporting i believe the 21st and then the veterans come in the 23rd for the raiders and then we're off and running yes and uh the good news is that means there will be football uh to talk about that's the one thing a lot of work for us but for fans and for me the fan and me of the game i love it because that means we're just closer to sundays again which is awesome so we appreciate that by the way we're going to get into our mailbag uh before we do that make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio we appreciate that very much the support there is amazing and you guys continue to help the show grow so thank you if you're watching us on youtube or any of the other video channels please follow subscribe like and all the other things there as well and please uh, take part in the chat wherever you're watching as well, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Rumble, whether it's YouTube. YouTube has the most lively chat, so we appreciate that as well. So come on in and have some fun. So thanks to everybody else uh, out there watching and listening. And now we're going to get into the mailbag segment, which Mo and I love doing, especially during the offseason when we're doing it every show. And we've had such great calls and participation. Mo, it's, it's, it's always good to hear from people because – we hear different opinions. We hear uh, people who disagree with us, people who agree with us, people who bring us new points of view. It's even led to you writing pieces based on a question somebody said. So you guys have incredible value, and we certainly appreciate it. We're very lucky that we get really intelligent. They're either really funny or they're really smart calls <laughs> um, and, and texts here at the show. So we're going to get into that as well, and we will answer those questions too. So. We're going to get started. And we're all over the country today. We're going to go first down to Texas, to Texas. Texas Raider is first up here on the Raider Nation mailbag. This is Raider Dean from Texas. Raider Dean. And I just want to say that uh, there have been Super Bowls won without a bona fide superstar quarterback. And all of this stuff about the Raiders quarterback and hey, give him a chance. <laughs> Let's wait and see. All these people that's, that's, that's predicting us, that's giving us a grade of D and all of that, they've been wrong before. So let's just wait and see. Let it play out. There you go. Raider Dean. Sorry, I called you the Texas Raiders. Raider Dean from Texas. So we appreciate that very much. Uh, but Mo, his point, so so his latter point about, hey, ESPN, we talked about this last week on the show, giving the Raiders a D for their offseason moves. I agree. It was all because of the quarterback position, and then they factored in drafting Brock Bowers, which I understand that external point of view if you don't cover the Raiders, but I also understand that people, if they, they, they could say Brock Bowers is a great player and blah, 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 
but they're looking at him as a tight end and I don't look at him as a tight end. I look at, look at him as a multi-purpose tool, meaning that he can play the wide out. He can play H back. He can play tight end. He can do all sorts of things. So with that piece of it, I agree with you, Raider Dean, but when it comes to the quarterbacks, uh, I, I get this Mo and I think it's people stay, trying just to stay optimistic, which is totally fine. But I get a lot of the same pushback, which is, well, there's been plenty of quarterbacks who weren't great who won the Super Bowl. Um, and I would say that if you look back at the history of the Super Bowl and teams that have won in the last, I don't know, 20 years, uh, it's hard to find you know, those guys. You go back to, let's see, I'm going all the way back to boom, Nick Foles. Boom. Yes, Nick Foles is one who sticks out. Okay, that was Super Bowl 52. And then you have to, before that, you got to have to go all the way back to, let's see, Mark Rippon maybe in 26, uh, Super Bowl 26. Um, so, so, Brad, so it's Brad the, Johnson, Trent Dilfer. Brad Johnson, Trent Dilfer. Right. They were not, they were not, uh, where is this MVP? Okay. So they were not MVPs, but they were, yes. And those guys, so you're going back, what, 20 years at least? 25? At, at, about that. But yeah. the, 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 the point is that, the quarterbacks who who were average or some people say below average mediocre they're outliers if you <laughs> look That's at the saying. quarterbacks yes. if you look at the quarterbacks who've won super bowls even outside of patrick mahomes and tom brady matthew stafford uh, is regarded as one of the top is even at his age still regards one of the top quarterbacks in this league so what i will say to raider dean is look at it this way and I understand from a fan perspective, give these guys a chance. And I want to be clear about this. I'm going to speak directly into the mic when I say this. We're not saying that these guys have no chance of being good or leading the race. No. We're just giving you an opinion as ESPN is giving you an opinion. Because if we got up, Scott, if, if you and I got up here every day and said our analysis for the show is let's just wait and see. All right. Good night, folks. <laughs> Goodbye. Would you listen and watch us on YouTube if we if that was our analysis of the Raiders quarterback position? Hey, yeah, uh, let's just wait and see, guys. Guys out there. Okay. Show's over, Scott. Let's go. 30, you know, three minutes we're and we're out. That's all we need to say. Wait and see. But no, we, we're in the business of giving opinions. And yeah. some of the opinions <clears throat> are going to be about the Raiders quarterback position are going to be optimistic and some not so optimistic based on the track record. So it is what it is. If you don't want to hear the opinions, I would advise you not to listen to these sports shows. But if you, if you want an honest opinion of people who's gonna who are gonna tell you what they think, you know, then tune in. But that it's all it's all conjecture, it's all analysis, right. it's all opinion. It's not to say that this can't happen. It, it's just this is what it is. This is what we think right now. Now it's uh, I've said this before. It's up to the Raiders. It's up to Gardner Minshew. It's up to Aiden O'Connell to prove anyone wrong about their opinion of them. Yeah. So 100%. we will see, we will see, but we can't get on the show and say, we'll hey, see. let's just wait and see. Yeah. And by the way, <laughs> so you go, you go back to the Mo, and this is the point I was trying to make. Uh, okay. You look at the last um, 10 Super Bowls, Mahomes, Mahomes, <laughs> Stafford. Okay. Tom Brady, Mahomes, Tom Brady, Nick Foles. There's your outlier, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady and Russell Wilson. That's the last 10 quarterbacks to win a Super Bowl. None of them were fourth round draft picks. Well, Nick Foles wasn't even a fourth round draft. Pick. So, so you look Not at that. Ready. So, so you're right. Out of the last 10 Super Bowls, there's been one outlier. Now, does that mean it can happen? Yes, it can happen. Is it most likely to happen? No. It's not impossible, but it's also not probable. And that's that's what I get to. Nothing is impossible. Right to your point and to Raider Dean's point, which is a good one. You just don't know. Right? Somebody can come out and have the year of their life, i.e., like Nick Foles, who came out off the bench and took them and won a Super Bowl against Tom Brady. Okay, that can happen, no question. But is that what you bank on? What are your What are your odds? Your odds are much higher if you don't have that bona fide franchise quarterback. And even then, you're not guaranteed to win it. You got to do everything else around that quarterback too. So I get that point, uh, and it's it's always good and worthy discussion. And really quick, Tom Brady is the ultimate outlier because he was a six-round pick. I, I get that. Mm -hmm. But how many Tom Brady's are out there in the league today? Correct. How many How many Tom Brady's are just walking into the league and saying, yep, yeah, I'm the next Tom Brady. Going to win multiple Super Bowls, multiple Super Bowl MVPs. Going to be regarded as one of the best quarterbacks of all time. 
those yeah. quarterbacks aren't growing on trees. So. Yeah, and even uh, I had a great discussion with somebody online who was talking about Joe Montana because I in incorrectly identified Montana as a first round draft pick in one of our shows several weeks ago, and he was not absolutely right. But at the same time, remember th the way eras matter as well, Mo is. Back back when Joe Montana came out of college, I mean, he won a national championship at Notre Dame in 1977, the big green machine, right? He comes out, and back then, it wasn't like now where quarterbacks all go in the first round. If you're a bona fide starter, you go in the first round. That's not how teams were built then. You didn't build around a quarterback. The offenses were different. So, the, the, so it's hard to sometimes compare that, and that's why I put so much emphasis on – the round the quarterback selected in now because it is so much different than it was 40, 45 years ago when quarterbacks, it wasn't all about the quarterback. They would go running back first. They would go all different types of positions before the quarterbacks because the offenses were different. I'll say this, and I and, and again, we're not saying Aiden O'Connell can't be the guy. Mm -hmm. can't, and we're not saying that he can't lead the Raiders to at least the playoffs because we've seen fourth rounders do it. We've seen Kirk Cousins do it. The Vikings played well. The Washington com now Commanders, Dak Prescott, fourth round pick. Yeah, you know, Dallas Cowboys perennial playoff contender. I think he took over for Tony Romo. So we've we've seen this before with middle round quarterbacks playing well enough to get their team to the playoffs. But but the point is, the Raiders themselves, if you believe in the reports, they were interested in the quarterback in the first round. Had the quarterbacks not gone before they got on the clock, and then they they. Brought in Garner Minshew. And before the draft, Antonio Pierce wasn't convincingly saying Gar A. O'Connell is our guy. No. So they, I don't want to say they have questions, but they weren't settled on, okay, we believe in A. O'Connell. We don't need anything else. Right. They also kept their options open. So that, that also tells you that they're, you know, while they don't doubt A. O'Connell, they also wanted to, to potentially find a franchise guy or an upgrade as well so not only uh not only is espn saying this not only you and i saying this but the team showed you this by bringing in Gardner Minshew. if you believe in reports by being interested in a rookie quarterback to draft early so question marks are there but now that it is what it is the situation they weren't able to get a young quarterback they're going to put their chips behind Aiden o'connor Gardner Minshew, whoever wins the battle this summer Right. And I'd happy, I'd be happy to be wrong about my opinion. So we'll see. Uh, uh, Raider Dean, thanks, man. We appreciate your call from down in Texas. Now we're going up to the Pacific Northwest with Rob in Portland. Hello, Scott and Mo. This is Rob calling you from sunny Portland, Oregon. <laughs> and I have a question for you about our beloved Raiders. So this past weekend was Father's Day, and I was watching a replay of the Chiefs getting their asses handed to them by our Las Vegas Raiders on Christmas morning. And there was one play in particular that stood out and mostly because of the comment that the uh, commentators made about it. I believe the play was to Isaiah Pacheco on like an end around. He runs it. He fakes a handoff to Mahomes and then jukes the defenders and gets into the end zone. I'm sure you remember that play. It was one of the only few <laughs> bright spots for the Chiefs that day. But the commentators said that, that Andy Reid had picked up that play design from the Chicago Bears. So that gets me thinking, did I hear that correctly? And if I did hear that correctly, do we think that was a Luke Getze designed play? If so, that gives me some confidence heading into the new year that we're going to have some innovative play calling. Just wanted to run that question past you. Maybe I was hearing things or seeing things. Who knows? Love the show. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Take care. All right, there's Rob in Portland, and 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 interesting because yes, I mean coaches when when they go to watch the film for the team they're playing that week, they go back to old film and they watch what's worked against that Raider defense, which was playing really well at the time, and so they saw something in the Chicago game, and most likely yes, a Luke Luke Getzey play, uh, but I don't know, and and God bless. Rob for being so optimistic that he sees one play and he's feeling better about Luke Getze. But it's a good question, Mo. You remember that play? I don't remember the comment made. But yeah. like you said, it wouldn't surprise me simply because the Bears beat the Raiders handily in Chicago earlier in the season. So it's not surprising that, you know, these coaches are watching the film, you know, 35 hours a day. Yeah. So they're, as you said, they're they're trying to figure out, okay, what worked against them? We'll we'll pick up that play and we'll use it and, and try to execute it as well. So wouldn't surprise me. 
Uh, but what I'll say about Luke Getze is if you look at his total body of work, and I always say, you know, you can you can have a good year, you can have a good play, you can have a good day, but you need consistency. So Luke Getze may call a great game, may mm-hmm. have had a good play. I want to see that. I want to see the consistency week to week because you could do it once. You know, anybody can do something yeah. once. Can you can you replicate that? Can you duplicate that? Can you can you find some consistency? And I think that's going to be key for the Rays, and that's what they're trying to do right now at training camp. Is fine. It's do the install, get these guys acclimated. If you read the reports, Devontae Adams is helping a lot of the young guys understand the system because he's worked with Luke Getzey before in Green Bay. Once they get through that step, you hope to see a, a, a well-oiled machine come training camp, come the preseason, and then week one of the season. Right. The old saying is that consistency uh, is is consistency is what brings average to excellence. Right. So you have to go from that next step. So so, Rob, maybe you're on to something. Maybe we'll see some more creativity uh, out of Luke Getze when he's here. I think that's what the key is. Mo and I have been harping on it a lot. You guys are probably tired of hearing it, but you can hear a lot more of it because I think that's the biggest question mark along with some of the offensive line and running back and some of the other things. We'll see how that shows, but we'll get a better sense for that in camp as things roll as things roll around. So thank you, Rob. We appreciate the call. If you want to get on to next week's show, by the way, you got to call us uh, or text us if you're shy. If some of you guys are shy, you just want to text us. That's fine. Uh, 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. That's the Raider Nation hotline. Remember, leave your name, city, your comment, or your question, and we'll get you on the air next week for the show. So make sure you do that. Okay, we're going to get to our last call of the day and of the week. This is John, who's called in before from Oroville, California. So back down to Cali. Here we go. Hi, this is John from Oroville, California. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, talk I've heard about the Raiders potentially trading Devontae Adams to the Rams for a first round pick. I actually am not completely opposed to the idea. Uh, it may be something you want to wait and see how things are going halfway through the season. But uh, as far as getting younger, one option would be to do this deal, trade him for the first round pick, and go after Brandon Ayuk over in San Francisco, who I believe very much would like to be on our roster. Hmm. Uh, Thirty million a year, but what are we paying Devontae? Thirty-five, I believe, somewhere in there. But Ayuk uh, and Devontae both great players, but I think Ayuk could potentially. Uh, fit our new offensive scheme with kind of a, I don't know, a more physical attack, okay, on Zamir White you got as the running back. You've got a couple of stud tight ends that are going to pound on people. I mean, if you add Ayuk, even if you lost Adams, you still have a very formidable offense. Um, And you're getting younger at the same time. Uh, Just one thought. And then about the quarterback talk going after a potential free agent that's not a free agent yet (laughs) and Dak Prescott that I've been hearing for hours and hours lately. Uh, I'm sure he's a great guy, but again, I just feel like building through the draft is such a better way to go about it than trying to win a Super Bowl by picking up a free agent halfway through their career. I'm a big believer in building through the draft. I believe in Aiden, and if I'm wrong about that and he doesn't, become what I think he can become and doesn't show what I think he will show this year, then you go into next year's draft and you keep an open mind and maybe go after Sidori Sanders. But uh, for now, give the kid a chance. Let's see what we got. I think he showed a lot in that initial game against the Chargers where he was getting lit up. He came back and nearly won that game. He's shown me a lot. So let's see what he's got. Let's go Raiders! <laughs> there you go, John in Oroville, California, man. Thanks for the call. Uh, a couple of things I want to pull out there, Mo. Number one is, yes, I was I was not surprised by uh, the reaction to us discussing someone else's story about the Raiders. Uh, it was a writer from Bleacher Report, your colleague. Gary talking, Davenport. Yes, Gary Davenport, talking about uh, that, that it would make sense for the Rams and that the Raiders could – could offload him and get a first round draft pick because they need to build. And so we talked about that a lot and you pointed out very specifically on that show that you wouldn't want to do it now. 
But certainly as you get closer to the trade deadline, it becomes more realistic if and if we're not saying it's happening, but if the Raiders don't do well, if they're not in playoff contention, you know, weird things can happen in a season. Then you think about trading him. This was, of course, about trading him before the season started. And so so that's one thing. The second thing, Brandon Ayuk, and I've told you this before, Mo, and you might, you might not agree with me, but I look at the history of football. I've read a lot of stuff, including Bill Walsh and other GMs, great coaches. And I think the last thing you need if you're the Raiders right now, even if you trade Devontae Adams away, is a $30 million wide receiver. You don't have the quarterback, right, that we know of. Now, if Aiden O'Connell changes, that great. But if he doesn't and you need to get a quarterback, to me, having a $30 million wide receiver like Brandon Ayuk, great receiver, you're, you're swapping out Devontae for him because he's younger. Makes sense, logical. But from a team need perspective, to me, the wide receiver – is the last thing that you want to spend the money on. Now, if you're ready and you, like the Rams, they're they're a step ahead, ahead of the Raiders, I believe. If you do that as a last piece to get you over the hump, I understand paying the money. But the stage the Raiders are at, if they were to offload Devontae Adams, I don't think you offload them and then go sign another $30 million uh, wide receiver. It depends on the circumstance. I'll have to see what the Raiders cap space looks like in 2025. Because let's say let's say the Raiders are I'm not saying this is gonna happen, okay? Wanna make this clear. I'm not saying this is going to happen. But let's say the Raiders are one and six, right? And they're thinking season is going sour. We could possibly get a top five pick. We trade Devontae Adams, we get another draft pick. We'll acquire Brandon and I. You could we'll get younger at wide receiver. Maybe Devontae Adams wants out, maybe he wants to go to a playoff contender. Okay, we draft a quarterback high with one of the draft picks, and we acquire Brandon Ayuk with another pick. That way we get a young quarterback and we get the receiver within a six-month span. Look at what the Chicago Bears did, right? Mm -hmm. So the Chicago Bears, now they had the number one overall picks. So it's a little different. They knew, basically, they knew what they were getting. But if you look at the Chicago Bears, they went out, they acquired Keenan Allen. Right, They already had DJ Moore, but they acquired Keenan Allen, and then they draft Caleb Williams. Now, again, they had the number one overall pick, so they knew what they were getting. But let's say if you're the Raiders and you get a top – and you you pretty much – I don't want to say no, but you think you're going to get a top five pick and you think you're going to have a shot at a quarterback, a starting caliber quarterback who could be a franchise player. Why not take a step ahead and get the wide receiver beforehand if you're pretty sure that you're going to get a young quarterback because now you'll have, a, you'll have that receiver that can grow with that young quarterback because the second step after – well, actually the third step. You get the young quarterback, you protect him with an offensive line, and the Raiders are pretty comfortable with their offensive line. I like the Raiders' offensive line. We'll see what their Mumford is as a long-term starter, but I think their offensive line is already pretty solid. The next step is getting you know the, the, the talent around him. They already have Brock Bowers, they have Michael Mayer, they have Jacoby Myers, but let's say, again, that Devontae Adams wants out. I, I wouldn't be opposed to swapping out for a younger wide receiver who can get you the big explosive plays over the top because you're going to want that wide receiver. If it's not Devontae, you're going to want that young top flight wide receiver to grow with a young quarterback. Yeah, I just think I go back to the 30 million. You mentioned Keenan Allen, who's guaranteed 43 million in a four year contract. That's a lot different than guaranteeing somebody 120 million uh, or whatever Ayuk wants. But I don't disagree with you from the standpoint of if everything else falls into place. Meaning that, like you said, the offensive line is fine the way it is. Those guys all develop and, and they play well together. Mm -hmm. Great. So then now you don't have that problem. On the other side of the ball, how's your defensive front? They signed Christian Wilkins. Yes, they have Max Crosby. We know those guys will be good. Uh, we still have to see what Tyree Wilson's able to do. He finished the season strong. Then you have linebacker. You drafted Eichenberg. You have uh, Spillane there who's going to need to either be signed or you let him go, whatever it may be. You have Malcolm Kuntz. You have these guys that are on defense. And then you have your cornerback situation. So to me, if you're going to do that, to, 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 to John's point, then you have to – all the other question marks have to be answered, in my view, at least most of them, not all of them, of course. But most of them would be have to be answered before you spend that money on a wide receiver, even getting rid of Devontae Adams, which, like I said, I don't think they'll do. I think the Raiders are not going to have a terrible season, so I think the chances of him being traded are more likely going to happen mm -hmm. after the season, but we'll see. Uh, but certainly, certainly a good question, and this is all – this is all conjecture. We're just talking about this. We're not advocating for it, but John brought up the point. And I think he's right about getting younger. I love Devonte Adams. Great, amazing player. If the Raiders can make noise this year, great. That's who you want there. You want one of the best in the league out there catching balls, no doubt. Uh, but if it doesn't work out that way, then the Raiders have to make some tough decisions, Mo. 
Absolutely. And the one thing we always talk about, Scott, on this show is one of the most valuable things in the NFL is a quarterback on a rookie contract because it allows you to spend hmm. and even overspend if you want to on certain positions on the play you really want. So let's say, you know, they really want Brandon Ayuk. And right now, like, they have Garner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell. Aiden O'Connell isn't making much. Garner Minshew signed a two-year $25 million deal, but they, you know, they can easily move around, cut up whatever the case may be if they get their franchise quarterback in next year's draft. Whoever they draft, if they draft someone, rookie contract. Right. So the Raiders are going to have some some room to spend if they want to, and they'll have the ability to pivot from Devontae if Devontae wants out. Again, I'm not advocating to trade Devontae, but if he wants out or if there's a difference of opinions on the direction of the team and he wants to leave, you have a way, you have the financial resources to pivot, assuming Brandon Ayuk is still available. He doesn't resign with the San Francisco 49ers this year. Yeah, or get moved somewhere else. You never know what's going to happen, so we'll see. All great questions, all great calls. We appreciate it. Again, if you want to be part of the show next week, 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Leave your name, city, and your question or comment for Mo and I, and we will answer it to the best of our abilities. We won't guarantee that you'll like the answer, <laughs> but we will give you one anyway. <laughs> so we certainly appreciate that. Mo, you got anything else coming up this week? Since we're only on once this week, just a, a reminder, this is the only show for the week. We'll be back next Tuesday. So uh, anything between now and then that the folks need to be ready for on the Mr. Midtown Mo front? Kept it simple this week over at sportsnot.com. Three Raiders that'll be under the most pressure going to training camp. These are mm -hmm. Raiders that are going to feel the heat a lot more than their teammates simply because if they don't win a starting job this offseason, they may never win one with the Raiders. They may have to go somewhere <laughs> else to win the starting job. So the heat is going to be on for three guys that I pointed out in that piece that's coming out on Thursday over at sportsnot.com. All right, there you go. Uh, and we will, we will do a show if something happens, if there's news or something like that, we'll jump on and talk with you either a live show or – uh, our normal show. I don't anticipate a lot of guys on vacation right now, I think, including some of the coaching staff. So we'll see. Uh, but the, the NFL never sleeps. There's always people working. So if something drops between now and next week, we will definitely get on as well. You can also look up uh, our YouTube channel. We have shorts up there. We have little things that we do around uh, the other content too. So make sure you check that out. All right, my friend, I will see you next week. See you next week. But don't forget, Stabler, LaMonica, Plunkett, Gannon, Carr. That's the order for, for Scott's a little different. He's flipped mm -hmm. Gannon and, and Plunkett. For your, all the Plunkett fans out there, send Scott your hate mail. That's where it should go. <laughs> <laughs> you think he should be a little higher than four on the list of all-time Raider quarterbacks. That's okay. That's what makes those lists great is people have their <laughs> own. And so leave your list in the comments below the, the podcast or on the video versions of the show. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Momotin, this is Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Thanks for being with us. We will see you all next Tuesday. Have a great week.